Last Sabbath, we had the amazing opportunity to have four little children to bless and ask God's protection on moving forward in their life. And for me, it was just a reminder of how amazing children can be, what a blessing they can be. And as a parent, those of you that have been parents, you look at this little person that you now have responsibility to take care of in life and to watch them grow and develop before your very eyes. You turn around twice and they're off to college. <laughs> um, but when they're young, you can begin to see their personalities emerge. You see their potential. You see your, their dream, your dreams for them and the joy they can bring. And even though they're young, there's even a simple wisdom of life that they can have. Um, and so I, as I begin here, I want to share a few of those things with you. This is from Patrick, was age 10. He says, never trust a dog to watch your food. <laughs> so this one's from Michael. He says, when your dad is mad and he asks you, do I look stupid, don't answer him. <laughs> Talia says something similar from a different perspective. When your mom is mad at your dad, don't let her brush your hair. And then Michael learned an important lesson I'm sure his mother would appreciate. He says, don't sneeze in front of your mom when you're eating crackers. <laughs> and Joel, <laughs> Joel here, he says, don't pick on your sister when she's holding a baseball bat. <laughs> and then Eileen finally says, never try to baptize a cat. Beyond what we can teach children, there's much that we can learn from them as well. And I'd like to begin today in Matthew chapter 18. Christ used the illustration of a young child to teach the disciples an important lesson that they were missing, and by extension, and a lesson that we should learn as well. We have at least twice in the gospel accounts a record of the disciples sort of arguing, if you will, between themselves, who was the greatest. And Matthew 18 is one such instance. And as Christ addresses their question here of who is the greatest, in verse 3, Matthew 18, verse 3, he says, Surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, this is an interesting statement from Christ here that many don't know what to do with um, because they miss the context of what he's talking about, why he's bringing this forward. Um, you know, do we become like little children in terms of attitude? You know, little children can have very powerful emotions, and so they can throw tantrums at times. They act on impulse at times. Um, you know, do we approach things that way? Is that what he's talking about? What is he leading to here? Well, again, in verse 1, this is the question that's been asked. Who is the greatest? They're looking at... Um, Christ returning, not returning, that Christ was going to establish the kingdom, and they thought in very short order. And so they were wondering what their place would be in this kingdom. They were looking at this, though, as humans basically look at anything. We want to know where we stack up, where we stand in the group. They wanted to know their status amongst themselves. And he uses this child, as we see in verse 2, as an example. He calls this child to them to use this as a teaching point because young children, for the most part, don't have this desire for power and recognition that they were talking about in verse 1. And so in verse 2, as he calls this child, I find this interesting as well, that the little child responded. We don't know who this child was. Um, they were traveling. He saw this child. He called, and the child responded, which I think is very interesting as well. Simple obedience there. In Matthew Henry's commentary, he had this to say about this section of Scripture. He says, Children, when very young, do not desire authority, do not regard outward distinctions, are free from malice, are teachable, and willingly dependent on their parents. It is true that they soon begin to show other dispositions, and other ideas are taught them at an early age. But these are marks of childhood and render them proper emblems of the lowly minds of the true Christians. To go back to what he said there, the lack of malice, that they're teachable, that they're willingly dependent upon their parents. And I believe it's safe to say that Christ here is talking about these positive aspects of children responding and that we can learn from them. And so today I picked out seven characteristics that I thought would fit well with this. I'll list them out here, but I'll restate them as we go through them. Positive attributes of children, first of all, are that they're eager to learn. 
and that they can be very quick to learn. Secondly, they're easily entreated. Third, they love in spite of correction. Four, they cling to family. Five, they're concerned primarily with the necessities. Six, they believe what they're told. And seven, they trust easily. So even though most of us are no longer children, these are things that we can learn from. And so today we're going to take a look at what it means to become like little children. So again, here in verse 3, Christ, to restate this, reread it, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like little children. So in context of the conversion that we're a part of, changing from human carnal nature to godly nature, that we're to look at these attributes and apply them on a spiritual level. Um, hold your place here. We'll be back in a moment. But I want to read the account, in, a similar account in Mark chapter 9. Mark 9 and verse 33. They again had this question about who is the greatest. And the context is different here, different time. And Christ sets the stage, if you will, to sort of challenge them. This is not just a question they asked him. This was a conversation they were having behind the scenes. So Mark 9, verse 33, and then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it you disputed amongst yourselves on the road? Now this is an instance where I am pretty confident that he knew what they were talking about. I think he wanted to see what they would say whether they would own up to it, and if they did, even if they didn't, that he would use it again as a teaching point. They're embarrassed. So in verse 34, they kept silent because upon pondering it, they realized how petty it probably was, and maybe this was not the first time that this had come up amongst themselves. It says, for on the road they disputed amongst themselves who would be the greatest. So verse 35, you know, again, he teaches them. He doesn't chide them here. He, he takes them where they need to be from where they are. So he says, he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, if anyone desires to be first, he needs to be last of all and servant. As even Matthew Henry said, there's this teachability that children have. There's a natural humility, especially when they're very young. They know they don't know, and they're willing to learn. And here, he's trying to show them this. If you desire these things, you need to have this kind of humility. So verse 36, he again takes a little child, set him in the midst of them, and when he had taken him up in his arms, which is why we do the blessing of little children when they're very young. This is the example that we follow. A child that can be held. He takes them up in his arms, and so he says to the disciples, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me, Whoever receives me, receives not me, but him who sent me. So he's, he's adding a little bit more here to this. Because again, they were convinced that this kingdom was going to be established in short order. And where would they be? What position would they have? They were looking at it from a carnal standpoint in many ways. But it's an understandable thing, isn't it? Many of you work in the corporate environment. You probably see this on a regular basis. Who gets the assigned parking spot? Who gets the corner office? Who gets the perks? Lines up and try to maneuver for those things. We see it sports teams, the athletes that want to make sure they get FaceTime on ESPN or you know, notoriety in the paper when the team wins, a musician that wants to be in the first chair, you know, all of these kind of things. We want to know where we stand humanly in relationship to those around us, if we're at the top or the not. But again, if we went back to Matthew 18, the question was, what was the greatest? That's the question here in Mark 9, too, isn't it? But again, they're not looking at it right way. God, Christ, wanted them to have this childlike attitude, not the carnal attitude of the world. Because he's not just talking about governing when we stop and think about it, what is he really trying to teach them? He gives an idea here, verse 37, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. What is that talking about? It's talking about relationships. By extension, what we talk about as a church is family, 
you don't function in a family like you do in a corporate environment. You're not going to have a very happy family, and it probably won't last very long. We have to work together. This is part of what God, Christ, here is trying to show them. And so let's get into these various points. Number one, that children are eager to learn. They're very quick to learn, aren't they? The little sponges that they are, because everything's new. They don't know anything. They don't know how to feed themselves. Initially, they don't even know how to move, right? They have to learn how to sit up and then stand up and then walk and all these things to feed themselves, dress themselves, take care of all these things, learn a language, learn how to read, learn how to write, everything that's happening in those first formative years. But they have a lack of concern that they do it wrong, Right? They can say the wrong words. They may not even pronounce it. and You have to try to figure out what they're trying to say. But let's go back to Matthew 14. We have here the story <clears throat> towards the end of the chapter of when Christ walked on the water. Now, there's a story behind this story, and that was that Christ had asked them to go ahead. They were out on the boat over the course of the night. The storms were up. They made almost no progress in moving forward. They're exhausted. They're probably very frustrated. They see Christ walking out to them on the water. At first, don't know who it is. They're all wigged out, freaking out, thinking this is some <laughs> spirit or whatever. And Christ assures them in verse 27, be of good cheer. It's me. Don't be afraid. But even here, he's, he's showing them something. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, Command me to come to you on the water. And so Christ simply responds, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Without realizing it, what Peter was doing here was emulating Christ. He was learning to be like Christ. And he didn't stop to question what was being done. And it's not that we don't ever question anything. But in this example, he had the Savior right in front of him, and he modeled that behavior until he didn't. He began to question it then, didn't he? And then everything went sideways. He started to sink in the water. He had to call out to Christ. But, but the eagerness to learn here, we can look at Peter and say, well, he doubted and he didn't have faith, and, but how many of us have even done that little bit that Peter did? He had for that moment that desire to learn from Christ. Let's go to Psalm 119. David talked about this extensively throughout the Psalms, but especially in Psalm 119, as I was putting this message together, I thought I would go through all the times David used the expression, teach me, and then I realized that would probably take most of the sermon time. And so I just want to highlight a couple here. Psalm 119 and then verse 12, he says, uh, make sure I'm in the right place. It doesn't look right for some reason. One nine, Psalm 119, verse 12. Blessed are you, O eternal. Teach me your statutes. This is not just a statement. This is an expression of a desire. I want to know. He acknowledges who God is, that he's blessed in these things, and he's asking him to teach him. So then verse 26, to look at another example, same chapter, he says, I've declared my ways, and you have answered me. Teach me your statutes. There are seven more times just in this chapter that David asks God to teach him. Again, one of the really wonderful things about little children is their teachability. You know, they're like sponges, just soaking up everything around them. That's a caution we have to have as parents to make sure that they're being exposed to the right things. But spiritually, how teachable are we before God? Do we have that childlike attitude, desire, just to, to learn as much as we can? One of the more frustrating aspects of my responsibility as a pastor is when someone comes to me asking for understanding or direction for their life from God's Word, and once I show them from God's Word what He expects of them, to see them reject that because they know better. 
No betters in quotes there. Again, how teachable are we? Peter forgot being teachable. He was there, and then he forgot. We have those examples in Scripture, and it's just something to keep in mind. So then, number two, children are easily entreated. What does entreated mean? It's not a word we use much in our English language today, but the English word entreated means simply to ask earnestly, to beseech, to implore, or to beg. It's a strong desire, and we're asking for something we really want. Let's go back to Psalm 24. To me, this whole chapter is David beseeching God, entreating him, asking him, begging him for the things that he wants. It says, The earth is the eternal's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the water. So he's asking these questions, but they're not just questions. He's asking God to entreat him. Who may ascend into the hill of the eternal? Or who may stand in his holy place? By asking the question, what David is essentially saying is, I want to. You know, do we ask God for the important things? It's easy to ask him for things, but do we ask him for the important things? This is what David is doing here. Who, can, who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessings from the eternal and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. So again, he's using this language almost in a third party, but read it personally. He's asking God, this is what I want. This is what I really desire. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? A relationship. These childlike attributes are to help us have the relationship with God that we need. Who is the King of Glory? The, the eternal strong and mighty. The eternal mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of Glory shall come in. Do we really want God in our lives? Or is it only when we need him? Who is this king of glory? The eternal of hosts. He is the king of glory. David here has a heartfelt request and a desire to have God direct him. He's beseeching God, asking him, begging him to help him to see and have these things. Do we regularly ask God to direct our paths, to guide us in our decisions, to be merciful to our shortcomings and weaknesses, and to have him teach us? We may not ask it in that way, but do we do those things? Do we plead with God to be a vital part of our lives? Because we know from Scripture there's coming a time when it says it'll be too late. Seek me while, you, while I can be found. Number three, then, is that children love in spite of correction. There's a bond that children have in the way that God designed families to function, and it's the right thing. And when correction is done properly, that love is not compromised. This is a lesson lost on most modern parents. Their fear is that if they discipline their child, they will harm their self-esteem. Or worse, they won't love me. What they don't see is that by correcting wrong behavior, you make them stronger. You direct them. You channel them. Spiritually, it's not much different. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah asked a request of God here that most people would never ask. But Jeremiah was also smart enough to ask in the request for God's temper, to be tempered. Jeremiah 10, and in verse 24, he says, O Lord, correct me. Have you ever prayed that prayer? I don't necessarily encourage you to do so without following the rest of what Jeremiah is saying. I had a friend at college that did this one time. He thought his life was going too smoothly, and he decided that he needed to be challenged, and so he asked God to correct him. And there were all kinds of his friends that said, that's probably not the best thing to do. <laughs> he received an answer to his, his, his prayer, uh, not what he expected. He understood after the fact. 
Jeremiah, this is the way he tempered it. Correct me, but with justice. Do it so that you know it's the best, not just to correct me. Because he says, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. And the caution we have as parents is that we correct not in anger. It's easy to correct in anger, but it doesn't bring the same results. Because now we're, we're punishing, we're not correcting. Anger doesn't bring the right result. But when correction is done with love, or justice as he puts it initially there, then it strengthens everybody, doesn't it? You correct behavior that is not behavior that should be continued, or you um, stop behavior that's leading to wrong things. Love is not diminished, is it? Proverbs chapter 9, let's look at similar thought there. That can, can we be corrected? Now, when you look at the example of the disciples, and as I said, at least twice in the gospel accounts, we read of them disputing amongst themselves as to who was the greatest. But they learned what Christ was trying to teach them, didn't they? Later on, they went out in very powerful ways. Look at Peter in the day of Pentecost, Acts 2. Look at what Paul, who came a little bit later, was able to do. Look at the rest of them. But in Proverbs 9, in verse 8, it says, Do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. So what's, what's the problem with trying to correct a scoffer? They know everything. You can't correct somebody who knows everything, can you? So why do they have the attitude that they know everything? Because they're not humble. There can be a whole lot of reasons that go behind that, but th this is the connections that we're making here. If we remain humble, then we won't be a scoffer. We can be corrected. Notice the balance there. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Because when you correct someone who understands correction helps, and especially if correction is done in the right way, that they end up being better for it. Um, Proverbs 29 and verse 1. Proverbs 29, verse 1. He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. There's no coming back from it. He who is often rebuked and hardens his neck. It's not comfortable to hear correction, is it? So again, we're talking about relationships as a family, having this attitude of a little child. So as we interact with each other, how do we, how do, we do that? Do we do it this way? Do we correct one another in love? Do we correct one another um, so that it doesn't lead to this hardness of heart? You can say the same thing multiple ways, can't you? Get different results. The, I think it's the King James that says, um, he was often rebukes and becomes stiff-necked. <laughs> You're just immovable. We've probably all dealt with those sort of people, haven't we? They, they just won't listen to anyone else. And children can certainly be strong-willed, but the capacity that they have that we need to not forget as adults, but especially as Christians, is that they also easily forgive, don't they? You know, they have a meltdown over a toy, and you go in and you resolve it. Well, you can share the toy, or here's another toy, and you can play together. And then oftentimes, within a few minutes, you know, they're playing wonderfully together. That's all past. Let's look at this in 1 Corinthians 14, that even Paul talks about this attitude of how to be like a child in these things, and yet even as we mature spiritually. 1 Corinthians 14, and in verse 20, he says, Brethren, do not be like children in understanding. You know, don't remain ignorant. We all have to start somewhere, don't we? Children start somewhere. And that knowledge accumulates very quickly initially, but then you build on that over the course of a lifetime. Spiritually, it's no different. It's not wrong that we don't know, but that's not where we need to stay. 
study and meditation, application, bring those things uh, to a deeper level. So don't be like children in understanding. However, in malice, be like babies. That capacity to quickly forgive, that children love in spite of correction, that even in these things, if somebody is correcting us in the wrong way, to understand if there's anything of value in there, and then to address it and move on. So be in malice, be like babes, but in understanding, be mature. So do we love God when he corrects us? That can be a challenge at times, can't it? <laughs> With correction, again, is never comfortable, never something we look forward to. But do we see that he is doing that for us to have salvation? God doesn't correct us just because. He corrects us because he wants us to be in his family. We have to take on his nature. And so that we need to have that love in spite of correction. Number four, then, is that children cling to family, especially when they're young, right? Um, found out very quickly last weekend, Mr. DeVildis and I, there were a couple of those little children who didn't want anything to do with us putting their hands, our hands on them. You know, mom or dad only. Yeah, I don't know you. <laughs> um, let's go to Colossians chapter 3. You see this, too, as children sometimes go off to kindergarten, first grade, um, you know, this uncertainty. Mom's not there anymore. Dad's not there. These times of life of transition. Um, and this is the way God has designed it. Family should be this sanctuary and this place of safety, familiarity. In Colossians 3 and in verse 12, Paul says, Therefore, as the elect of God, you and I are part of that body of Christ. As such, we're holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Verse 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Now, how does this fit with the point of clinging to family? You can't cling to family if you're not practicing these things. You're going to have a family that doesn't have mercy for one another or kindness for one another or humility or meekness or bears with one another, these other things. That's not going to be a family you're going to stick around with very long, is it? But as a family, these are things that we should put on and things that we should cling to with each other, that we serve each other. Sometimes we take the hits for each other, but we forgive. We follow Christ's example. Family gets through it and moves on. Because being in a family is not about being right all the time. Siblings will make sure that you know that. <laughs> it's not about holding on to past hurts. It's not about making the other person pay for a wrong. That spirals down real fast if you get into those circles. Being in a family, though, is to help children deal with the world around them. I told my kids all the time when they were younger, my job is to make them productive adults so they didn't need me. That sounds counterproductive, but I don't want to have to take care of them their whole lives. I want them around, but I don't want to have to take care of them. I haven't done a very good job if I, if I teach them that. Let's go to Ephesians 5 to come back to another aspect of this these characteristics of children within this aspect of clinging to family. Ephesians 5 and verse 21. Paul simply says, Submit to one another in the fear of God. Now, he's talking about in general here, these verses around 20 of our walk, if you will. Then he transitions into marriage, the roles of wives and husbands, and how that reflects our relationship with Christ. But it all begins with verse 21 the submission that we're to have to one another. And that's very true in a family, to cling to that. You know, we'll give our families slack that we won't give anybody else, don't we? Because we know them. We stick together. We're supposed to. First Timothy 5, to, to have this not just a familiarity and not just a comfort, but this desire to have each other around. And so, in doing so, we show this respect. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 1. Do not rebuke an older man, 
Paul here is writing Timothy as a young pastor, and he's giving him a perspective here. He says, you can't just go rebuke an older man, especially if he's wrong. There's a way to do this, he says. He says, but exhort him as a father. That's a different relationship, isn't it? The respect, the deference, the love, the concern. And then he says, younger men, correct them as brothers. You know, you can go to a brother in a way you can't go to some other people. Because, again, you have that familiarity. You have that commonality of family. And you can say, look, I understand where you're coming from, but you can't do this. And a brother will hear you oftentimes the way someone else will not. Do we cling to that kind of family? Number five, then, a child is concerned primarily with the necessities. They're, they're not in, I mean, they quickly grow into this, but they're, they're not into the latest electronics or fashion or status at school. That all comes later. But when they're young, what are they worried about? Am I comfortable and am I full? <laughs> Let's go to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs 30 and verse 15. I always get a kick out of this verse. It says, the leech has two daughters. Give and give. A leech is never satisfied, is he? Man, I'm sure you've encountered people like that. They're never satisfied. We can easily be distracted. Mr. Knack talked about the, the oh, just the unhappiness is the way I would put it in the world around us. The negativity but there's also never enough, is there? There's always a bigger, fancier TV, uh, nicer car, bigger house. You know, we chase these things as a culture. The leech has two daughters, give and give. And there are th three things that are never satisfied. Four is never, never say enough. And then he goes on to talk about these things that fall into these categories. In this chapter, Proverbs 30, verse 7. Two things I request of you, Solomon said. Okay, so if the leech is saying, give and give, is it wrong to ask? No, it's not wrong to ask. It's what you ask for. Is it necessity or is it want? Is it desire? So in verse 7, he says to God, two things I request of you, pri deprive me not before I die. Verse 8, remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor nor riches, feed me with the food allotted to me. What is he talking about here? Not so much that I forget you, because if we have money, we don't need God, do we? We see that in the culture around us. But if I have too little, then I end up compromising God's law, don't I? I can steal, I can demand, I can do things that he says not to do. And so Solomon here is asking for balance. He's asking for the necessities. Remove falsehood and lies. He wants to be able to see God's truth. Feed me with the food allotted to me. Give me what I need. And that's even in the model prayer, isn't it? And as I mentioned, ch children, generally speaking, only care about the basics. They don't care if their clothes don't match. Try to tell a two-year-old their shoes don't match. <laughs> they don't care. It, it, I like it. They don't care what kind of car you have. They don't understand the desire for status. They're in the moment. They're happy. They care about love, safety, and fairness. Fairness is huge when you're little. <laughs> so do we focus on things not important for salvation? And we can easily get distracted by the shiny things in the world around us. But are we focusing on the wrong things? Do we ask God to help us with the basics of our calling? that we don't have too little or too much. Number six then, children believe what they're told. And this is a caution for parents, isn't it? Because children will believe whatever you tell them. Let's go to Titus chapter one. This is the simplicity that they have of trust and that they have no reason to doubt that you're gonna tell them or ask them to do something that isn't for their benefit. This is the caution even in this world. I gave this message this morning up in Oshkosh, and I had an individual come to me, showed me a picture on his phone, and he says, that's me. 
He says, that's when I got my first dirt bike. He looked to be about nine or ten years old. He said, that was the Christmas I found out that Santa was a lie. And he said, I wish my parents had never lied to me. It struck a chord with him. All these years later, he remembered that. He didn't remember the Christmases so much as he remembered that his parents lied to him. Titus 1, and in verse 15, To the pure, all things are pure. They have no reason to think otherwise, do they? Because in their mind, pureness is the foundational baseline. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. For somebody that has that kind of mind, you've probably had conversations with those people. It's foreign to them that somebody would think the best of people, or that life is good, or that all kinds of things uh, are possible. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. Even their mind and conscience are defiled. So, do we understand and believe what God is offering? Do we have that pureness? We just went through the conclusion of God's holy day season for this year. It's truly an amazing thing what he is offering us. Here we are, humans with feet of clay, violate his law on a regular basis, struggle to maintain and to achieve the type of character that he has, and yet he wants us in his family. And he is doing everything he can to help us when we are part of the process. Let's go to Luke chapter 24. It's not wrong to believe something and not question it, especially when you have someone you trust who is telling you this is the case. As parents, that's, again, the caution, isn't it? Because children will, as I said, believe anything you tell them. You know, why, you know, they're full of questions at a certain age. Why this? Why that? Why? And you can give them any answer. And you have to be careful because they can begin to believe these things, especially if it's not true. And then at some point you have to fess up and say, well, yeah, I didn't tell you the truth. That was, this is the truth of the matter or whatever it happens to be. Luke 24 and verse 25. Christ here speaking says to the, uh, the various disciples there, he says, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. So, here he is, the Son of God, the culmination of what the prophets talked about, what they foretold, what they pointed all of God's people to. And he's saying here, you're slow of heart to believe. We should never get to a point where we become so jaded that we don't want to listen. I've seen people get there. It's not a good place to be. Because that trust is hard to bring back, isn't it? If trust is broken. Um, the old story, I'm sure it's anecdotal, about the two little boys talking about finding out their dads were the ones that had been dressing up at Christmas time to be Santa Claus. And how disillusioned they were now. They thought this was real. They believed the stories just to find out that it's dad dressing up. So then one of them looks to the other and says, I'm going to look into this Easter bunny stuff too. But it sets a questioning mind, doesn't it? If they lied to me here, what else are they not telling me the truth about? And I have to wonder how many have rejected Christianity because they've been lied to about all kinds of things that are not in Scripture. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. This is an interesting section as... Chapter 12 in 1 Corinthians, Paul had to address how poorly they were using the various spiritual gifts that God had given to them. And rather than serving each other with these gifts, instead of strengthening each other as a family, they were using these gifts as wedges to beat each other up. Well, you're not as good as me because my gift is better. And so he gets into chapter 13, which we call the love chapter. He says, no, you're missing the point. All of this, if it's not done with love, it's meaningless. And so then in verse 7, he says that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And it's not that they question or believe without questioning, I should say, 
but that there's this confidence in who's telling them these things. Do you and I bear all things with each other? Do we believe all things that God has shown us? Do we hope for the things that he has revealed to us? Do we endure all things in the meantime? Do we believe God? Lastly, then, seven, that children trust easily. And this is different than the previous point in terms of trust. It's not trusting what they say. It's trusting what a person represents. John 14 and verse 1, Christ made a statement here about trusting him. John 14, verse 1, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believed in God. Believe also in me. They were very familiar with God from the scriptures. They were very familiar with what the prophets taught. They were very familiar in their own experiences. They understood God on a certain level, and Christ is saying, look, if you trust him, you can trust me. We're no different. How do we know we have that trust? Well, Titus gives us a very simple statement, and many will dismiss it, but it changes everything if we ponder it and believe it. Titus 1, verse 2 where Paul simply says here in the middle especially, talking about the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Do we believe that? See, if as a parent I tell my child, you can trust me. You're in the pool. They're three years old. They're learning to swim. Jump, I'll catch you. They have no context for that other than what everything else before that you've done for them. They've never jumped into the water. They, they don't know if you're going to catch them. They don't know what's going to happen. And they reach that critical point where in their mind they simply say, yes, and they jump. Do we believe and trust in who God is at our core like a child does? Let's go back to Matthew 18. And we'll continue past where we initially read. Matthew 18, again, verse 1, the disciples were disputing amongst themselves, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And so Christ calls the child, sets them in the midst, and says, verse 3, Surely I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The attributes of all these things we've covered today. Verse 4, Therefore, in light of this, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest. He answers their question, not the way they expected. He says, if you want to be great, you have to be humble. But humility is not a self-deprecation. It is a realization that you're just part of a family, that you need to be taught and corrected and trust and love in spite of correction and all these things we've talked about today. That humility, that if you don't have that humility, then you won't have these attributes of a child. He says, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. That Christ reflects these very attributes. Verse 6, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. And that seems a little bit over the top, but who wants to go there? That's a pretty severe consequence, isn't it? I firmly believe that Christ was referring to little children here, those attributes they have, especially before they get tainted by the world to the extent that they can be. We have a moral obligation to protect our children, to shelter them, to keep them safe, especially morally and physically and even emotionally. But I also believe that Christ here is talking about protecting little ones amongst us. It's easy to see chronologically, isn't it, that a two-year-old needs protecting, but Christ came to serve. And he's setting up a, a way of life that's contrary to what this world currently understands. That's why the disciples were disputing amongst themselves. They looked at it from a worldly perspective. 
They wanted to be great in the kingdom without understanding the responsibility of how that needed to be done. So again, Christ is not just talking about authority. He's talking about relationships. You and I have been given great authority. How do we use it? The interesting thing about the expression here, little ones, is that it's not talking about chronological age. The Greek word there simply means something small in quantity, the least of something or less than something. So a child is a little one because he's not an adult, doesn't have the mental capacities that an adult has, the knowledge and understanding and so forth. It doesn't minimize the child. It just simply says that they're, for now, they're less. Well, what about somebody that comes into church, maybe has only been attending two years, but they're 60 years old? Are they a little one? From God's perspective, they are. They haven't matured into the family yet, and yet we have a responsibility as a family to operate and to help them in the fashions that we've talked about today. Let's look lastly at Philippians 2. Philippians 2, the beginning of the chapter there, verse 1, he says, Therefore, if there is any consolation of Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. What was Paul's joy? To see people grow into the family of God to take on the attributes of being eager to learn and easily entreated and loving in spite of correction and clinging to family and concerned with the, the necessities and believing what God tells us and trusting in all of that to take place. That's the joy he's talking about. If there's any consolation in these things, fulfill my joy by being like minded, having the same love being of one accord and one mind, one purpose, one desire. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. That's the mindset of a little child, isn't it? Or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. We come back to that humility. In lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. And that's the beauty of a family, isn't it? We don't each have to be the best at everything. We strengthen each other. We support each other, especially where they're not strong, to fulfill that joy. Verse 4, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but for the interests of others. You and I have just come out of the fall festivals and all the wonderful things that are pictured in those days. Are we in the right frame of mind to move forward? I find it very interesting that Mr. Armstrong was inspired decades ago to use the Sabbath directly after the feast to do the blessing of the little children. Are we teachable like little children? Let's take the admonition that Christ gave the disciples and become like little children before him.